reporting on allegations of misconduct at the Federal Minerals Management Service. It's the agency in charge of collecting royalties from gas and oil companies who drill on federal lands. Witnesses include Interior Secretary Dirk Kempthorne, the agency's inspector general, and the director of the Minerals Management Service. This hearing of the House Natural Resources Committee is just over two hours. Committee on Natural Resources will come to order, please. Mr. Secretary, Inspector General Devaney, we thank you for taking the time to appear before the committee today and appreciate the work that you've done. And I want to say in the very beginning, I certainly agree with the comment made in your latest report, Mr. Devaney, that 99.9 percent of all the employees at the Department of Interior are hardworking, professional, and have the interests of the American uh, taxpayers at uh, heart. Uh, let me state that I'm not going to rehash the sordid details of the jaw-dropping antics of certain employees of the Minerals Management Service that were revealed last week in three IG reports. And Mr. Secretary, I want to commend you. You have taken forthright action even before the release of these reports, and you have called me on this latest report and uh, updated me on the status of, of the actions that you've taken, and, and I commend you for taking those actions. What I do want to focus on during this hearing are three matters. First is rather the culture of ethical failure that the IG found within the Royalty and Kind program is just the tip of the iceberg. Are we faced with a burgeoning scandal in terms of ethical lapses within the MMS? Or were the instances set forth in the three IG reports issued last week the total extent of it? Second, to what extent can we determine how much those eth ethical lapses have cost the American taxpayer? We certainly know from both the IG and GAO investigations and hearings that have been cut conducted by this full committee and our subcommittees, that programmatic failures are costing taxpayers money. Just last week, for, an in for instance, GAO reports found that the United States receives one of the smallest, one of the smallest shares of oil and gas revenues in the world, that the federal and oil and gas leases are not being diligently developed and that production is only occurring on 12 percent of offshore leases and 5 percent on onshore leases. And we found that the Interior Department is unable to provide certainty that companies are paying the royalties owed the American people. So I think it is now appropriate to see if we can get some inkling as to the extent that the cronyism between MMS employees and the oil and gas companies have cost the Treasurer in terms of royalty underpayments, lack of royalty payments, and shortcomings in the royalty in kind transactions. And finally, third and finally, from what I can tell to date, only two MMS employees have been prosecuted. Jimmy Mayberry, who pleaded guilty in July to conflict of interest, and Milton Dial, who entered a guilty plea just this past Monday for rigging bids. I'm curious as to whether the IG has sought further prosecutions from the Justice Department and what the response has been. As we all know, these are serious issues, but they are more serious now as we face a certain prospect that vast areas of federal waters will become to open to oil and gas leasing in the very near future. These issues are serious within the context of onshore oil and gas leasing and leasing within the Gulf of Mexico, but they will become more amplified when we expand leasing off the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. Coast. Mr. Devaney, I do thank you. Thank you very much for your diligence on these matters. I note the number of hours, the, number of time, the amount of time that it has taken uh, for this investigation, the frustration that we all felt with it due to lack of cooperation uh, from the big oil companies, one in particular, Chevron, but uh, I do appreciate your diligence. I've also uh, been at this a long time myself, 
longer than I care to mention. I was on this committee, for example, when we crafted the first federal onshore on uh, oil and gas royalty management act of 1982. And we thought, we thought we had solved it then. I, I was chairman of what was then the energy subcommittee in 1987 when our previous full committee chairman who is with us this morning, Mr. George Miller, and I championed the Federal Onshore Oil and Gas Reform Act. And I have to say that the only issue before the committee that has been more vexing in my tenure here is reforming the mining law of 1872. So, Mr. Secretary, I just want to state here and now that I greatly respect you and I have complimented uh, the reforms you have made. You are a person of courage and conviction and I am aware of your attempts to emphasize ethics and stewardship within the Department, stewardship and our responsibility to the American taxpayer for the disposition of their resources. Certainly the ethical failures that were the subject of the IG's reports issued last week took place, as you have told me and as we are all aware, between 2002 and 2006. And I would note that you were confirmed by the Senate on May 26 of 2006. I am also aware that you are taking action, presumably with respect to certain civil service employees named in those investigations, and as such would not be able to delve into the details on those actions during this hearing. I recognize that there are criminal investigations, for example, ongoing to which we cannot refer. So, gentlemen, thank you again for appearing before this committee. And I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mexico, Mr. Pierce, for any comments he may wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, today we are going to hear from uh, Secretary uh, of the Department of Interior, Dirk Kempthorne, and uh, the DOI Inspector General, Earl Devaney. I would like to personally welcome back the inspector. It is always a pleasure to uh, visit with you here before this committee. The uh, subject is the recently completed reports by the inspector focusing on the shameful, disgusting and deceptive behavior by a handful of career employees in the Department of Interior. I can say that each of the seven times that these, uh, these reports have been leaked to the press, I have found them equally disgusting every single time, and all the reports have been about the same behavior by the same people. Uh, I expect that no one here today will attempt to defend these career employees, many who served from the Carter and Clinton administrations. There is no defense for their actions. The juicy details of their salacious behavior are more appropriate for the pages of People magazine than the congressional record or the front pages of the Washington Post. However, clearly these de details draw the media's attention and by their attendance the attention of my Democrat colleagues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the last 18 months since the inspector first mentioned this investigation, it has cost nearly $5.5 million. During this lengthy process, many of the worst offenders have continued to hold jobs at the Department of Interior while the Secretary was unable to take action against them, awaiting the inspector's report. Some of those uh, employees were allowed to go into retirement rather than face disciplinary action while we were waiting on the report to be issued. I have confidence that we will hear from the Secretary his plans to take decisive disciplinary action against these individuals now that he has finally gotten the reports, and I would like to hear what we are going to do about those people who have been allowed to retire uh, before action uh, was taken against them. Uh, so let there be no doubt the reckless behavior by these employees has brought shame and cast a shadow over all outstanding and responsible employees of the Department of Interior. Sadly, many may now question the behavior of other employees in other parts of the Department. There may be those who ask, are the Park Service employees too close to concessionaires? Did those fish and wildlife personnel, service personnel fabricate data or provide inside information to environmental lawyers? Are those agency officials lobbying for legislation? It is unfortunate that this fog is cast over this historic agency. What is more unfortunate, however, Mr. Chairman, is that, uh, that it takes an issue like this for our committee to hold a hearing focusing on the most important issues facing the American people, energy, at a time when our constituents are struggling to make their budgets balance while they face $4 gasoline, rising food costs, increasing taxes, the committee responsible for legislation addressing America's energy production has gone nearly half this year without a hearing on energy. We have had no hearing on the, uh, the newest energy proposal that went before the, the House floor a couple of nights ago. Uh, we have had two historic highs on energy prices without holding a hearing. We had the, the, the largest hurricane since 1909 
uh, hit right in the heart of the Houston Energy Corridor and still we had no hearings. It is not that there aren't solutions out there. Among my many proposals, among the many proposals before this committee, I have introduced legislation to bring more than 6 million acres of new solar power to the American people, but the opposition by radical environmental groups has prevented this bill from even getting a hearing. Mr. Peterson and Mr. Abercrombie have introduced bipartisan legislation dealing with the OCS. Our ranking member has legislation that would increase America's domestic supply by 20 percent from only 2,000 acres. Mr. Lamson, Mr. Green, Mr. Bishop, Mr. Cannon all have legislation before this committee which could help address America's energy problems, yet we have gone nearly half this year without debate, consideration or hearing on energy. Instead, on the House floor we are passing legislation telling the American people to spend more time riding bicycles. We are giving more stimulation to bicycles in the latest energy plan than we did to nuclear power. We should be helping lower the price of energy across the board, lowering the price of gasoline and the price of electricity for people to heat their homes. China gets it. China is converting from bicycles to nuclear. China is building a new coal-powered plant each week. Meanwhile, Americans are facing a winter with possibly the highest home heating cost ever. Americans are worried about our standard of living. They are worried about the ability to pay for the college, kids' college, and we are sitting here discussing the intimate behavior of at least 12 30-year career analysts or thir and one 30-year career analyst from an interior office in Denver. With all due respect, I wonder if our time wouldn't be better spent debating energy legislation and finding a bipartisan solution for the American people. Last year, we had the courage to debate in this committee. Over several weeks, we debated our views and proposals for energy in America. Each of us got the opportunity to put forward proposals to solve the energy crisis facing America. This year, we are holding one hearing in the last half of this year, and the subject in this hearing is, could be the subject on a cable TV miniseries instead of the real problems that face Americans. Mr. Chairman, I I think I speak for every one of us on this side of the aisle when I say it is not too late in this session to have the courage to debate energy legislation in this committee. It is not too late to put our proposals on the table and find a bipartisan solution to the energy crisis that we are facing Americans. I believe in American exceptionalism. I believe in our ability to bring hope to the entire world. I believe in our ability to solve this energy crisis. I believe this committee can and should help America solve the energy problems that we have. I would yield back my time, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Thank the gentleman for his stump campaign speech. The gentleman from California, Mr. Miller, wish recognition. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for holding these hearings. Is uh, is. Uh, disgusting and as serious as the behavior of these employees is, it is far more uh, important, I think, to us uh, whether or not we can uh, properly uh, determine uh, whether the Royalty and Kind uh, project is, the, uh, is the best, in the best interest of the, uh, of the taxpayers and, in fact, whether our whole current royalty system is in the best interest of the, uh, of the taxpayers. Uh, and, and I think that uh, hopefully this hearing will shine some light on those uh, on those issues, uh, at a time when uh, uh, when uh, this administration has run up a 500 billion dollar uh, deficit, uh, I think we ought to be looking at uh, at making sure that we're getting a fair shake uh, for the uh, for the people's resources. And in fact, at, at, uh, at the, the last part of uh, the gentleman's uh, statement, uh, this committee did take a big step forward when it brought to the floor the other night a comprehensive energy legislation. Uh, uh, to uh, to develop uh, the resources of this country, all of the resources of this uh, uh, of this uh, of this country, and I think that uh, uh, that was a very important piece of legislation, and be, un be under consideration in the Senate, I guess, today and tomorrow, and uh, hopefully they will take some action on energy legislation, and we can pass that on to the uh, uh, to the president. But I think we should get on with this hearing. Two important matters: one of grave ethical concern, and the other of fiscal concern that this committee should. Uh, should continue to monitor. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from California. Uh, gentleman from Louisiana, or, I'm sorry, General Lady from uh, Oklahoma, wish to be recognized. I'm not sure who was here first. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Actually, he was here before I was. And Ms. Oh, Mr. Lamborn was. Oh. Congressman Lamborn. But I will have questions. Any, anybody desire recognition on minority side? I would okay. like to wait and ask questions after I hear the testimony. Sure. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, chairman of our subcommittee on 
Energy and Mineral. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, last year, um, the Subcommittee on Energy and Minerals um, held a uh, series of hearings as it related to uh, the challenges that we find ourselves with uh, mineral and management services and the questions as to whether or not the royalty in kind uh, program was being uh, applied in the best interest of American taxpayers, uh, not only as it relates to uh, ensuring that, uh, that uh, those revenues uh, be received, but in turn that uh, we have an energy policy that reflects the current needs. Uh, last year it was clear that there were many problems that existed within mineral and management services. The Inspector General indicated that these investigations were taking place at the time that uh, uh, conclusions had yet to be reached. Um, and uh, still today uh, I think uh, many of us have questions as to uh, where we make the changes, how we deal with the issues in 1998 and 1999 when the program first began. and. Uh, how we uh, move forward as a part of a comprehensive uh, energy policy that uh, we are attempting to, to bring together on a bipartisan basis here uh, in Congress as we speak. Uh, today I am looking forward to seeing the Inspector General's report from the discussions that the subcommittee held last year uh, as to um, not only the depth of uh, the, um, the um, clearly um, inappropriate activities that were taking place, uh, how widespread they were, what the costs were to the American taxpayers. But more importantly, I am also seeking from the uh, Inspector General and from the Secretary of the Interior uh, where, what reforms you advise us in terms of where we go from here. The Chairman mentioned in his opening statement that uh, uh, when he chaired the subcommittee back in the 1980s and in the early 1990s, the different reforms that had taken place. Uh, clearly, uh, some of them uh, worked better than others in light of what we are dealing with today. So I am interested in uh, not only uh, trying to understand the, the dimensions of the size of the, uh, of the uh, inappropriate behavior and, and the, uh, the loss of revenue to U.S. Uh, tax dollars that took place as a result of, of, of the criminal action because at least in two cases because of the prosecutions that took place, we know that criminal action has taken place. Uh, and to uh, determine, uh, most importantly, uh, what uh, changes are being made within the Department, Mr. Secretary, to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And, uh, and then, of course, the separate issue is, is uh, uh, where do we go from here as it relates to the royalty in kind program? Uh, America needs a comprehensive energy program. Uh, we are attempting to try to put one together. The royalty in kind program, especially with the uh, determination for the expansion of, uh, of uh, oil and natural gas on federal lands, whether they be on uh, OCS properties or whether they be um, on the Outer Continental Shelf or whether they be on um, uh, land here within the continental United States or in Alaska, uh, is going to happen in my view and therefore we need to determine uh, whether or not uh, the royalty in kind program should be reformed or whether it should be uh, dismissed altogether and how we move on. So I am looking forward to the testimony in both cases as it relates to the current uh, issue at hand with regards to mineral and management services, but also the application as we try to cobble together a comprehensive bipartisan energy package that will reflect America's long-term energy needs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this. I, I need to apologize to members on my side of the aisle. Uh, Mr. Devaney does have to leave at noon. And unless there is a pressing, urging, burning desire to make an opening statement, I would like to move on with the witnesses. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, again, welcome to the committee. We appreciate your time and patience, and you may proceed as you desire. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, let me begin by saying that I deeply regret the reason for this hearing. I find the conduct of a small group of long-term career employees described in the reports issued by the Inspector General's office inexcusable. I am outraged that the public's trust has been abused. I am outraged that the ethics laws have been violated. I am dismayed that these activities could negatively reflect on the vast numbers of outstanding public servants that work in both MMS and in the Department of the Interior. 
I know that Assistant Secretary Steve Allred and MMS Director Randall Ruthie, both of whom are here with me today to respond to any technical questions, uh, share these feelings. When I accepted the President's nomination to be the Secretary of the Interior, I made clear during both my confirmation hearing in May of 2006 and my first days at Interior that I expect the employees at the Department to conduct themselves in accordance with the highest standards of ethical behavior. You can therefore appreciate my disgust when I read the three reports released by the Department's Inspector General, Earl Devaney. The first focused on three employees in the Minerals Revenue Management Division of MMS who were found to have circumvented the laws regarding conflicts of interest, post-employment restrictions, and federal acquisition requirements. All three of these 20-year employees have left government service. Two have pled guilty to charges brought by the Department of Justice as a result of the investigations and await sentencing. The second report focused on the inappropriate and inexcusable behavior of one employee, the head of the MMS's Royalty and Kind program. The details of this report are profoundly disturbing. This employee left government service prior to completion of the Inspector General's investigation. The third report focuses on the improprieties of some employees in the RIK program between January of 2002 and July of 2006. Within hours of being informed by the Inspector General of specific names and his preliminary findings in December of 2006, the decision was made to transfer a number of these employees out of the RIK program. In the memo conveying the reports, the Inspector General affirmed my frustration with the length of time that it has taken to receive these investigative reports. I have regular meetings with the Inspector General. I appreciate his interest in good government. We share that. At these meetings over the past two years, we have discussed the necessity of awaiting completion of these reports before taking any disciplinary action. The Inspector General has assured me that he believes the behavior described in these reports no longer exists in these programs. When I received the reports, I took immediate action. Within hours of receiving the Inspector General's final reports, Assistant Secretary Allred and Director Luthi initiated procedures to determine appropriate disciplinary action. We will follow the letter of the law. All employees are long-term career employees and must be afforded due process. I can assure the committee that this process will be completed as swiftly as possible and we will examine the full spectrum of disciplinary actions, including termination. Though these particular problems occurred in the past, I have also decided that the Department should expand its ethics office by placing an attorney advisor in Denver, Colorado. This attorney advisor will provide oversight and technical assistance to the ethics counselors of the Department's bureaus to ensure that each of the bureau's ethics programs is in compliance with all applicable ethics laws, executive orders, and regulations. Given the extensive departmental presence in the Denver area and the Rocky Mountain region, this individual will provide invaluable ethics support and program oversight. The Inspector General recommended four actions. We are und undertaking all four actions. We have initiated appropriate administrative corrective actions. We have enhanced our ethics program and oversight capacity in Denver where the RIK program operates. We are crafting a code of conduct. We have implemented organizational changes. The Inspector General pointed out that the reporting hierarchy of the RIK program bypassed the Deputy Associate Director in Denver where the program is located. Instead, the RIK Program Management reported directly to the Associate Director for MRM in Washington, D.C., 1,500 miles away. MMS Director Luthi has changed this reporting structure. I am committed to an ethical culture at the Department. I hope that the Inspector General would agree that we have undertaken efforts to promote a culture of conscience throughout the Department. In fact, at my first all-employee meeting on the second day of my tenure, I emphasized ethics compliance. I appointed a new designated agency ethics official, Melinda Lofton, who has decades of experience in government ethics. I also expanded the Department's trained ethics staff and initiated implementation of a set of best practices compiled by the Office of Government Ethics at my request. In 2007, I was invited by Inspector General Devaney to address all of the Inspectors General at their annual meeting. 
I was also invited by Rick Cusick, Director of the Office of Government Ethics, to address 600 federal ethics officers at their annual meeting that same year. Through these actions, we're affirming a culture of conscience. We developed a DVD where I discuss ethics standards at the workplace for the employees. We've published an ethics guide for new employees. And just last week, the Office of Government Ethics recognized this new guide by awarding the Department an Education and Communication Award. In March of 2007, I appointed a new independent subcommittee to the Royalty Policy Committee, the Subcommittee on Royalty Management, charging it to conduct a full and a candid assessment of the Department's mineral revenue management system. The seven-member panel was co-chaired by former United States Senators Bob Kerry and Jake Garn. And very talented and knowledgeable people worked with this committee. I asked Senators Garn and Kerry to look at everything. They were given a free hand to scrutinize all key processes, from production accountability and royalty collections to audits, compliance, and enforcement. All issues were on the table for consideration. In January 2008, Senators Kerry and Garn gave me their report, which states that, quote, the subcommittee members unanimously agree that the MMS is the federal agency best suited to fulfill the stewardship responsibilities for federal and Indian leases, unquote. The report also identified a number of needed improvements to the program. We've begun implementation of many recommendations provided by the subcommittee. Though my entire leadership team and I are offended by the misconduct of these employees, the issue arises whether their actions should call into question the merits of the entire RIK program. Several studies of the RIK program indicate it is a valuable tool that can result in increased revenue, reduced administrative costs for MMS, reduced incidence of valuation disagreements, and earlier receipt of royalty revenues. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me say something about the good that MMS employees are doing. With back-to-back -back hurricanes this season, members of an expanded MMS hurricane response team have worked nonstop since late August. Some of these individuals have lost or received major damage to their homes. Many left their families and homes in New Orleans, reporting to work in Houston in order to assist in restoring oil and gas production. I could not help but feel a great sense of irony these past days as we have been dealing with the preparation for the impacts of the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. One hour I'm discussing huge storms, acts of nature passing through the Gulf and the heroic efforts by MMS, including meeting environmental and safety standards to deal with these storms. The next hour I'm discussing an ethics storm, the result of ethics failures by a handful of employees. Both of these storms demand our attention. One shows the immense good that agency staff provide one does not. I know, as I'm sure you do, Mr. Chairman, that the actions of those discussed in these reports are not indicative of the quality of employees within the MMS or the Department of the Interior as a whole. And I appreciated your comments that you made at the opening. The vast majority of MMS employees are at their duty stations, doing excellent work every working hour of every day. And they deserve our commendation. I'm committed to ensuring that the Department's employees carry out their activities with the utmost of integrity. You quoted, Mr. Chairman, and I would quote also the IG who said, 99.9% .9 of DOI employees are hardworking, ethical, and well-intentioned, unquote. I share that view and trust that the actions of these few do not serve to tarnish the hard work by the vast majority of our employees and the ethical and diligent way in which they carry out their work. The abuse of the public trust in this instance is tragic. I assure you that we're taking swift and appropriate actions to restore this important trust. And again, Director Luthi, Assistant Secretary Allred are here with me to respond to questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And before uh, recognizing Mr. Devaney, uh, one of those individuals of the 99.9 percent .9 is with us today. She was singled out in the IG's report, uh, head of the Denver RIK program. Uh, she was singled out as having good uh, behavior, uh, highest ethical conduct, so much so that it uh, made her, uh, those working under her, 
go around her and report 1,500 miles away to Washington rather than directly to her, and that's Debbie Gibbs Schutte. And I understand she's with us today. Would you mind standing up so we can thank you for your uh, well intention and good behavior? Is, is Ms. Schutte with us? I understood she was. There she is. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Devaney. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today about recent Office of Inspector General reports that address a number of issues concerning the Mineral Management Service. I'll keep my remarks brief today, as I believe that the body of our work over the last several years speaks for itself. From a programmatic standpoint, our earlier four reports including the investigation of price thresholds, the investigation of false claims allegations, the audits of the compliance review process, and the evaluation of the RIK sales process were the most substantive in content. As you know, our most recent three investigations reports issued last week focused on egregious conduct by MMS employees. It is important to note that we believe the single most serious problem portrayed in these last three reports is a pervasive culture of exclusivity, exempt from the rules that govern all employees of the Federal Government. Simply stated, the MMS employees named in these reports had a callous disregard for the ethical rules by, by, by which the rest of us are required to play. Although it was not an inconsiderable number of individuals who accepted gifts and engaged in improper proper conduct, I believe it is important to emphasize that the majority of employees in the Royalty and Kind program were not part of such conduct and perhaps were not even aware of it. While the individuals involved in the improper, improper contracting extended beyond RIK, this does not implicate the whole of MMS. I reiterate my belief that 99.9% .9 of DOI employees are ethical, hardworking, and well-intentioned. Unfortunately, the conduct of a few does cast a pall over the whole, at least for a time. I am also at a loss to explain the behavior of the oil and gas representatives involved in these matters. It is disingenuous for employees of such major organizations, each with highly touted ethics programs, to pretend that they thought it was permissible to provide Federal Government employees with gifts in excess of well-known limits. As you know, all seven of these OIG reports have made headlines some more sensational than others. That, however, was never our goal. Rather, our goal has always been and is today to affect positive change. To this end, I must credit Secretary Kempthorne, Assistant Secretary Allred, and MMS Director Luthi for their receptiveness and responsiveness to the findings and recommendations contained in all of our reports, particularly for taking swift action in response to misconduct is exposed in these most recent reports. Implementing controls and competencies, however, is far easier, easier than imparting character. I am hopeful that our recommendations to the Secretary will help in this regard. First, there is a need to develop an enhanced ethics program designed specifically for the RIK program to include an explicit prohibition against the acceptance of any gifts or gratuities from industry, regardless of value. Second, MMS must develop a clear, strict code of conduct for the RIK program and finally, a change to the reporting structure of IRIK should be made to help avoid misconduct going undetected by long distance management. I believe that the environment of MMS today is decidedly different than that described in our most recent reports. While there is undoubtedly more that needs to be addressed, programmatic improvements must be matched with controls and strong oversight to ensure that this Bureau, which is so lucrative to the United States Treasury and the American public, does not again veer widely off track. I suspect that it is now clear to this committee, as well as to anyone else who has taken the time to read our reports, why I had identified the greater need for OIG monitoring over MMS in general and in their royalty programs in particular. When I testified before this committee in March, I described the beginnings of what is now called our Royalties Initiative Group, a modest audit and investigative unit located in Denver dedicated to royalties related oversight and improvements. This group is currently responding to a congressional request to review the status of non-producing DOI leases. They will soon be conducting an audit of MMS's processes for verifying volumes delivered as RIK, including oil destined for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Ultimately, we would also like to expand our oversight coverage beyond, 
coverage beyond MMS to the energy and minerals programs at the Bureau of Land Management and Indian Affairs. Mr. Chairman, I have deliberately kept my prepared remarks short today so that I can better answer questions of all the questions that you or other members undoubtedly have in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Devaney and Secretary. Um, let me begin the questioning with the issues I raised in my opening remarks. And I would ask you first, Mr. Devaney, in regard to the effect that these ethical laps have had. Uh, can you assure this committee that such lapse involving the federal oil and gas leasing and royalty management issues within the Interior Department, uh, can you assure us that there is reason to believe that this culture of ethical failure, uh, is there reason to believe that it persists throughout the uh, administration of the leasing and royalty programs? Uh, you, I, I know the assurances that you've said in your in your uh, uh, testimony just now, but it would seem with such uh, gross behavior occurring that we must be sure somehow that there are not others still there that have not been yet identified that perhaps feel they can still get away uh, with uh, such ethical behavior. And let, let me refer you spe specifically, for example, to report, a report in the Salt Lake Tribune from last week that indicated an investigation is uh, underway regarding royalty collections on BLM in tribal lands. Uh, could this extend even beyond uh, the oil and gas leasing program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you noted earlier, these, these things that we looked at in these three reports occurred sometime between 2002 and 2006. Um, as soon as I understood what we were dealing with, with regard to the focus of this investigation, uh, I did speak to Assistant Secretary Allred and Secretary Kempthorne, and uh, they immediately removed um, the four people we knew about at the time from there. I mean, it was within the same day, so it couldn't have been quicker to satisfy ourselves that those people weren't in place uh, continuing to do what they were doing. Uh, since that time, we have observed, and uh, this is both on our audit and investigative side, we have observed a marked change in the Royalty and Kind program. Um, several long-term career professional people have been put in charge of that program now. We are working well with those people. We are interacting daily out in Denver with those folks. Uh, I know they have put policies and procedures in place that never existed before. Uh, I would hope that this is a loud wake-up call for anyone who would even think about doing something like this again. Uh, I suspect that the oil and gas company, it will be a long time before the oil and gas company representatives begin to give gifts again to any of our employees. I would hope that those oil and gas companies look to themselves and, and, and also do the requisite ethics training that they, they obviously need. So I guess the answer to the first part of your question is, um, I will never say never, but I think the program is on a steady course right now. It is being led by professional people who, who have ethics at the very top of their list. And um, with respect to the second, without talking about a specific case, um, we, we all the time look at allegations about underpayments of royalties. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that happening. Uh, clearly, uh, when that happens, we, we look to see if it was deliberate, and if it is, we take that to a U.S. Attorney's Office. If it isn't deliberate, it was a mistake, for instance, uh, usually it goes to the civil side for some sort of uh, an attempt to collect the monies. So we're always looking at allegations that royalties have been unreported, and we do that all the time. But that's that's a behavior that we observe outside of interior as opposed to inside. So you can assure us this is it. It's not just the tip of the iceberg, that, but this is it. Uh, this, <laughs> this, this concludes uh, my, um, my, my current investigations of minerals management. Let me ask you a second issue uh, that I've already brought up. Is there any way to measure the potential loss, or I should say probable probable loss to the taxpayers as a result of the serious ethical lapses within the RIK program 
they were the subject of your recent investigations. Now, I realize it's probably impossible to put a precise price tag on the probable loss to the American taxpayers, but would you say the losses are probable, and would you say they are significant? Well, it, it was, in fact, very difficult to even get near a figure uh, when we looked at this matter, principally because within the program, uh, the contract files that we, we got our hands on were, were in terrible shape. They, they were unaudible by the auditor, forensic auditors working with our investigators. So it, it was, we were unable to show that any particular personal relationships resulted in particular um, benefits uh, to, the, to any of the oil and gas representatives. Um, if we had, uh, we might be sitting here talking about more criminal prosecutions because that's the, that's the kind of evidence that would have led to that. Um, but we couldn't and because simply because there were no rules, there was no policy, there was no guidance during that period of time. Now, that's all changed, but when we were looking at those contract files, they were in horrible shape and we couldn't tell uh, about losses. I would say that there probably some, were some losses, but uh, we have no idea how, what that figure would be. And MMS can't give us any idea either. We found that through previous hearings of this committee and investigations that we've asked for, that they cannot say yes or no right. as to regard to probable losses to the American taxpayer Mm -hmm. uh, and lapses in their fiduciary responsibilities. All I can say is if we were to, if, if we were to, and I, and I, this, I don't think this will happen, but if we were to go back in in similar circumstances today, I think we would find the records that would allow us to tell you that answer. Okay. My time has expired. There will be a second round of questions, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Devaney, if we're going to continue the line of questioning about the loss to the federal government, uh, the uh, I would uh, guess that we're saying that maybe the loss could be less than a billion dollars, so, you know, that, that gives us a benchmark. I wonder, you spent two years looking at this entire investigation. Uh, did you ever, in a previous question, a previous hearing, I asked if you would go back and ask Secretary Babbitt about was those 98, 99 leases that we're discussing, those are billions, 20 to 60 billions according to different estimates. Uh, did you ever ask him, was it a mistake? or was it directed? You remember we presented that letter to you that uh, you left out of your report that declared that the, the Clinton administration, it was not an oversight, that this was a dedicated piece. And so, so as we're discussing losses of revenue to the government, my question is, did you go back and ask Sec Secretary Babbitt, was this really a mistake or was it intentional? That, he's the one who could unravel the whole thing. We've got different viewpoints, so did you ask that question? No, I don't believe we, we did ask that question of Secretary Babbitt. I you know, I had requested before that you would do that, and uh, so we spent two years looking at something that's definitely under a billion. I would guess uh, it's under way under a billion, and we've got a $60 billion question, according to some, out on the table uh, saying that it was a mistake, and we've got uh, then the letter from the Clinton, the Clinton administration employee who said, no, that it was a mistake. We didn't think the price of oil would ever get high enough. Uh, it's distressing that you would not ask significant questions about things that you have written reports about that this committee has asked you to ask those questions about. It's distressing that we still now, a couple of years later, have not asked that single question. Uh, secondly, Mr. Kempthorne, is it within your agency rules to allow leaks of reports, these leaks of confidential reports? Is it within your rules to allow that? Confidential uh, Congressman, conf confidential reports are to remain confidential. And so it would be against the agency rules to allow that. Is there a, a pervasive, I'm going to use Mr. Devaney's words, a, a pervasive culture of exclusivity in the IG that turns a blind eye? This is the seventh report that's been leaked to the press. He says that, uh, that there was no attempts to get uh, headline press. But this is the seventh one that's been leaked, and has Mr. Devaney indicated any desire to give the full amount of attention to leaks inside the department, his group, 
uh, that he has given to the, uh, two and a, the two and a half years of investigation to the sex and lies. And, and believe me, I believe we should have done that investigation. But I think a culture of exclusivity which should be looked at in several regards. And has, uh, has anyone in your department requested an IG look at the leaks inside the IG that caused these headlines to appear in the New York Times before we even see the reports on this committee? Uh, Congressman, my conversations with the Inspector General, and again, we meet on a monthly basis uh, where he informs me and keeps me up to date, but I, I really cannot respond to uh, the, the aspect or the nature of leaks. I will put that in a request that we actually take a formal look at the seven times that this same report has been leaked in its process before we actually get it here. We were not able to prosecute any of the individuals involved. We allowed them to move toward retirement and get into retirement where, according to the testimony in our last hearing, and I've got that testimony here, according to the testimony that many of the times when they move to retirement, they're beyond the reaches to do anything to them. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that, uh, that we Get, a re get an answer why these leaks are allowed, and if, and I would like to request a formal investigation. We'll actually put that letter uh, into you, uh, Mr. Devaney. You mentioned that that it's unthinkable that with the uh, with the uh, touted ethics programs, that members of the federal government uh, would think it's permissible to provide government employees with gifts in excess of known limits. Um, did you ask the question, were those employees ever told, or did they have a reason to believe that such gifts were required or expected? Are you talking about the representatives from the oil and gas companies? Or Could they ever uh, have been led to believe that such gifts were required or expected? Because in payola, as a business owner, I will tell you that there are people who can give you the word that these contracts might come with the right little uh, touch. And I'm asking, did you actually ask the question of those, um, those oil company employees, was there the expectation or were they ever led to believe that such gifts were expected from the members of the department? Uh, I don't know if we asked the question that way. I mean, we asked them why they gave gifts and they gave us answers, a range of answers. Did uh, those answers include such things like they were expected? No, nobody, nobody, nobody would would nobody told us that in in you know for getting for giving a gift they would get something in return uh, in terms of the bidding going on with the oil and gas. No, I see my time has elapsed, and I'll come back to that. But uh, it, I find it amazing that you did not ask. Was there ever an implicit expectation? That uh, seems amazing because in all payola schemes. That knowledge is out there without the words ever being conveyed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your tolerance. Perhaps it would have helped if Mr. Devaney had better cooperation from the big oil companies. That's another issue. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Miller. Thank you, um, Secretary. Mr. Devaney, thank you uh, for being here this morning. What's the, what's the status of the, of the prosecutions here? Uh, uh, Mr. Pearson mentioned that people were allowed to transfer or to leave service. Uh, I don't know that. When you leave the government service, you're then immune from prosecution. What, 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 what's the status of, of efforts to, uh, to, to seek justice, if you will, here? Well, I think we're done. Um, we have two guilty pleas, and they're right. awaiting sentence. And the Department has declined to prosecute. The Department of Justice has declined to prosecute. You've, you, you've sent, you've sent indivi uh, individual requests for prosecution to the Department of Justice? Well, we were, we were working with the Department of Justice, in this case the Public Integrity Unit at Maine Justice, all the, all the time. We were working with them for, since day one. So we were, there was ongoing dialogue and at, 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 at a point in time towards the end of the investigation, uh, they decided to prosecute two people and not prosecute others. And that, that would end it with respect to the, to the employees, with respect to the Justice yes. Department? Yes. What about uh, uh, the representatives of the oil companies? Um, no. Were any recommendations made for prosecution by you? No, I did not. Why, why, why not? I, I, quite frankly, um, I was never, we were never able to show, uh, going to uh, Congressman Pierce's question, we were never ever able to show that there was any connection between the getting of gifts and the, uh, the manipulation of any, any bidding. So uh, we really wanted their cooperation and got their, sought and got their cooperation from three of the companies. 
uh, on making their individuals available to us for interview to, to ask them, you know, why were you giving our employees gifts and uh, to what extent did you do that? So in, the, in this situation, the liability runs only to the, to the government employee? It did in this situation. There is no bar of offering gifts? Well, I think there is, but I think that a decision was made uh, at the Department of Justice in conjunction with my investigators to, to approach the oil and gas people in a different way. Mr. Secretary, are we still doing business with these people who offered gifts in this, in the, under these circumstances? Uh, Congressman, we are still doing business with the companies, yes. So the same people who offered gifts uh, over the last couple of years are still in daily contact with the mineral management services? Um, I can't respond if they're in daily contact or if they're the same individuals, but uh, you could assume that that is happening. So what's the ethical message we're sending to those companies? Well, I think they're seeing, uh, Congressman, the fact that we're dealing with it within the department. We're dealing with personnel issues where actions will be taken. Um, because they are longstanding career employees, we, we will afford them all due process. No, I understand that. I want to know, I want to know about the companies. So the companies just go on and do business uh, tomorrow just as they did yesterday? Uh, Congressman, no. The, uh, and in fact, I think if we had others who could speak to this, but there has been a discussion that we will do an outreach so that they fully understand what parameters our employees must work under, and therefore the, the companies will know not to offer beyond that because it puts our employees in, in a, a very tough situation. Not to offer what beyond that? Uh, gifts that would exceed the gift ban, uh, activities that would go beyond what is in, within the ethical standards. So they can, they, <laughs> they can offer gifts, they just have to make a decision of whether or not it violates the gift ban. Does well, the gift ban no gifts, some gifts, a threshold? Is it $100, $150, $200? There is a threshold. The threshold is $20. Um, and uh, yes, there is a threshold that has been identified. So it's $20 per gift? Correct. So I give you a gift every day for 20 bucks? Or no, and it's cumulative too. So what's the, what's the upside level here? Well, I'll, I'll make that a part of the record. I'll get back with all of that. I, I just find it kind of disturbing that one half of the crime here just goes on and conducts business as if, it, as if nothing happened. You can, I mean, there's no, there apparently is no lesson learned in a sense inside that corporation because the same people are on the front lines holding on to the same relationships. You've transferred people and I thank you for doing that and I think you've handled this rather well. But we're right back with the same people who apparently thought there, there was some reason, some benefits to that behavior, and that, that behavior isn't outlawed. We don't debar them from, from uh, working with the government for a year or, or whatever it is. There's no prosecutions. Uh, uh, and it says uh, uh, you, 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 you won't receive any, uh, uh, police shall not directly or indirectly solicit or accept a gift from a prohibited source. Uh, because, of, but that apparently doesn't prohibit you from offering. So you can continue to try to, to uh, ingratiate yourself to an employee or bribe an employee. And if the employee says yes, you're in. If the employee says no, you're, you're, you're out. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Miller, what we have discussed and what I would like to initiate is an outreach program so that we do sit down and we go through this with the, the corporation so that they know exactly what the, the rules and the requirements are. They know what the rules are. I have all these companies in my district. They know what ethical behavior is and isn't. I don't know. I, I know the chairmen of the board. They know what ethical behavior is. They just, just apparently have chosen not to participate in it. We're going to take, we're going to take big grown up and successful people. We're going to give them ethics lessons. I don't get it. Congressman, I suspect the prosecution would focus the mind on the ethical problem as opposed to a, a DVD. Well, I, 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 I just don't understand it. 
You know, in the Department of Education, we go through the inspector generals and millions of dollars went out the back door, went out in conflicts of interest, and people were allowed to move on, people were allowed to retire, people who kept the, the millions of dollars wrongfully found, they're kept it, contracts are in place, they continue to be enriched. I don't get it. Congressman, it, it's all part of what is being evaluated now based upon the fact that we've received the report uh, last week. Um, and as the Inspector General has pointed out, many of these practices no longer happen. They What's not the standard happen. of conduct you're developing for the people having contact with the United States government? What's the standard you're imposing on the contractors? Well, it is to be of the highest of ethical standards. How do they know that? Well, I think they're knowing that from uh, activities such as this hearing. They're knowing that by seeing that there are consequences. Well, what's, what's in the contract? You do business with us, how do you, con how do you conduct yourself? Uh, I, would you, you got a written You got a written standard for, for the employees, but the other guy can keep baiting them and baiting them and baiting them, and I guess we, well, they'll, they'll either <laughs> love to take it or the resist or whatever they'll do. What about the behavior by the private sector here? Congressman, I think that the private sector is also seeing that there are consequences. There are consequences. What would those be for they the would, private sector? Well, they chose not to, one company chose not to cooperate, still doing business. The other companies cooperated. We appreciate that. And the employees are still in place. What is, what is it they're, they're learning from this lesson? Well, they're learning that as we have future activities, um, that we are adhering to a particular set of standards. What standards are you expecting them to adhere to? Congressman, there are standards of uh, appropriate behavior by businesses. And they're seeing that they're Well, you know, the American public would probably be surprised as they watch a meltdown all across the country in the, in the pillars of American society, the financial institutions, where clearly, you know, when you started loaning money based upon a liar's loan, that's what it was known as a liar's loan. You were loaning money to liars who had no ability to pay it back. And we want to talk about ethical standards. And here you're dealing with a very precious resource in a very delicate program with billions of dollars at stake. And we're telling the companies, well, you should learn something because we've, we've transferred some people from one department to another, what have you, and we've prosecuted a couple of government employees. But you don't have to change anything. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Congressman, this is all part of a process that is under review, that is being evaluated and examined so that there are lessons learned. There are certainly consequences that are being paid by it. I, well, I want to know what are those consequences. We're back to the beginning here. Within the, the same employees are dealing with the MMS. The same representatives are there. The companies have no, no greater burden imposed upon them. There's no changing of the contractual liabilities or the conditions of employment or engagement of, the, of these companies. Apparently, you can't answer the question. I have great respect for you, Mr. Secretary. And your ethical standards are way beyond this. And somehow, that has to be transmitted to the private sector. And the private sector has to know you don't get to come around and start offering gifts to people in a program when you have billions of dollars at stake and a little bit of change here and a little bit of change there can be worth a lot. And, that just, and Congressman, I have a great deal of respect you know, for you as well. As I've indicated, all of this is being evaluated as we look at what has transpired so that it does not continue. Well, I look forward to see what, what, uh, uh, what standards of conduct uh, will be mandatory with respect to the private sector here because, like many other Americans, I'm rapidly losing my confidence that they have any ethical standards. The gentleman's Thank you. time has expired. General Lady from Oklahoma, Ms. Fallon. I appreciate both you gentlemen coming today. Um, Secretary Kimpore, I appreciate um, you and your agency taking time to develop new ethical standards, to review the process. And, Inspector General, I appreciate your recommendations. I will say that I am very disappointed and totally find and, and find the behavior in the mineral management services employees' behavior unacceptable, and so thank you for what you're doing. I have a couple of questions to the Inspector General. When you were reviewing the information about the gift giving, did you find any evidence 
for the people that you reviewed that there was any directive from the top of the oil companies, the CEOs, the leadership, to tell their employees to give gifts to curry favors from the minerals management services? No, there's no, there was no evidence of that. And how many employees did you say you found that were acting inappropriately within the agency? Uh, there was, there's about a dozen. About a dozen that you found, okay. Now you said you began your investigation for a time period of 2002 to 2006. It took two years to conduct this investigation. When was the report finished on this investigation? Well, there's three reports, so they were each slightly finished at a different time. And when was your first report finished? Um, it was probably um, about, um, it, it make a dis I would make a distinction between when the investigation was finished and then there's, then there's, a, then there's a back and forth with the Department of Justice but, mm -hmm. as to what, what we might prosecute and what we're not going to prosecute. So when was something available for someone to see on this committee? On this committee? Or any committee, any, any, anybody. When was there a piece of paper that you could say, hey, we got a problem here? Well, we, we, we signaled that in a number of testimonies that we had these investigations ongoing. And, and what date was that? Was that March? The report was delivered on uh, September uh, 10th to Congress. So just a couple of weeks ago for your first yes. inkling that there's a problem, even though you've been investigating this for two years? Oh, no. No, okay. not at all. I'm just no. trying to figure out the timeline here. No, uh, the investigation took two years, and uh, like any white-collar criminal investigation, uh, we hold that investigation, we don't talk about it, we don't issue um, updates, if you will. Uh, there can be conversations, for instance, the Secretary mentioned he and I have had conversations. I've been trying to keep him updated. We shared the frustration of how long it was taking, but nonetheless, um, finished means that the, all three investigations are finished, all the discussions with the uh, Department of Justice have concluded, and then it goes through the quality control process in my office. It's printed, it's bound, and then it's put out, and that okay. was September 10th. If I could ask you, when did you notify this committee that there was a problem within this agency? <laughs> Uh, I think I, I think I alluded in, in previous testimony that we were conducting criminal investigations. Which is when? Um, as probably the last time I was up here in March. March, okay, okay. So here we are, and I guess my point is, here we are a week before we're getting ready to go home for the election cycle, but yet we're just now having a hearing on this issue, and here we've let from March to this time period go that nothing has transpired within this congressional body to look into a major issue of, of corruption and selling of, of favors within a, a, f a few people, and, and you said 99% of the people in the agency were not involved. I guess my question is, why are we waiting for, for this time period, a month before an election and a week before the session is over, to be discussing this when we should have been dealing with this a long time ago. Well, it, uh, I've been doing this for 38 years, and I've been in federal law enforcement for that amount of time. And I would venture to say that white collar crime cases with this amount of witnesses to be interviewed and this amount of documents to be looked at and these amount of witnesses that had to be brought before uh, and given uh, consideration by the Department of Justice, two years is actually not a long time. But with respect to when the report came out, it came out when all that process I just discussed with you was done, not a day later and not a day sooner, regardless of what time of year it was. But you first started telling this committee and some of the people about it in March. And I, I guess that's what bothers me, Mr. Chairman, is why haven't we had this discussion before this week? Now, I we also heard some talk about the loss of revenue from royalty leases and because of the behavioral problems. Could I also ask uh, our, our uh, secretary, have we lost any revenues for our nation on royalty leases because of the time delays, that the lawsuits, the protests over uh, the leases and the applications? I, I don't see how you would construct that we've, we've lost. Yeah, the time delays that it takes to actually produce a lease once a lease is let. We talked about losses because of corruption. Have we lost any money for our nation because of the time it takes to go through the protests and the lawsuits? I, I'm not aware of that having been quantified. Okay. I think my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
as far as uh, this first coming to light, I mean, we our hearing record is well documented back at the beginning of this Congress. Our hearings we've had on on this issue and uh, the potential loss of revenue. We've always known this cozy relationship existed. I would say the general lady. We just didn't know how cozy it was until recently. Uh, the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, would you yield for a second? I just have a qu the IG's report wasn't concluded until last week. Isn't that right? That's correct. So the committee is not going to compromise an ongoing investigation by holding hearings until the conclusion of a report, Correct. isn't it? Okay, thank the you. General Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mark Twain always said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does tend to rhyme. And this isn't exactly like the Powder River Basin scandal uh, during the Reagan administration uh, when uh, James Watt turned a blind eye to the under sale $100 million worth of resources at the Potter River Basin. I was the chairman of the Oversight Committee uh, in this committee back then, and I commissioned the GAO report that brought back all of the findings on that scandal, which ultimately led to the resignation of James Watt. Um, I know this didn't happen on your watch, uh, uh, Secretary Kempthorne. I appreciate that. But this is a blistering, scalding indictment. Uh, of the Bush administration oversight of the Department of Interior. Uh, this is uh, something that is a stain on the Department of Interior and its operations. Um, uh, Mr. Devaney, I congratulate you on your work. Um, Chevron did not agree to allow any of their employees to be interviewed by you. Is that correct? Uh, it's fair to say, uh, Mr. Congressman, that at some point Chevron obtained counsel for five of their employees and then we began negotiations, we being the Department of Justice and our investigators, to try to get those employees in for an interview and it never happened. It never happened. So Chevron has stonewalled this investigation. And well, Shell, Shell has refused to allow uh, one of their employees to be interviewed. Is that correct? I think he's a former employee and he was exercising, uh, as everybody has, their right to uh, remain silent. Now, are you saying he's doing that as an individual or is that Shell as well? I think, it, I think he, he, was, he was a Shell employee when the events occurred. He is no longer, a, my understanding is he's no longer a Shell employee and uh, he did not afford himself the opportunity to talk to us. Are the, are the Chevron employees uh, still at Chevron? I believe they are. So are they, doing, uh, are they refusing to testify in conjunction with legal advice from Chevron? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, no. I think, I think, first of all, let me uh, be very specific about Chevron. Um, we asked, we gave subpoenas to all of the companies for documents, and all of them, including Chevron, produced billing records and emails and et cetera. So with respect to documentation requests, they were cooperative. When it came time to interview, indiv uh, you know, do individual interviews, uh, Shell, uh, Gary Williams and Hess made, made their employees available. Chevron obtained outside counsel who, who, then, who then did not make those employees uh, available. So Chevron the lack of cooperation by the Chevron and Shell employees slowed down your investigation. It did. It did not allow you to get all of the information which you needed in order to make a definitive and final set of conclusions with regard to what was going on. That's it, true. That is true. Uh, did, the, uh, did, the, uh, uh, did Chevron then demand that the uh, employees there no, no longer have any a connect any uh, uh, work relationship with the Department of Interior? I, I don't know anything about that. Should they uh, demand uh, and should the Secretary of Interior demand that those Chevron employees not any longer have any uh, relationship with the uh, Department of Interior in, with, re with regarding to any of the matters that we are talking about in the uh, leasing area? Well, I would, I would hope that uh, Chevron might do an internal no, I'm not asking that. They're not doing it. They're not cooperating. No. Chevron is not cooperating. I'm asking you, what do you think the standard from the Department of Interior should be with regard to these five employees? Should they continue to uh, have business as usual in representing Chevron at the Department of Interior? 
Well, there are some there are some suspension and debarment possibilities here for both. Um, well, obviously for the company, which. Uh, well, what is your recommendation in terms of uh, keeping a uh, you know an arm's length distance now between these employees uh, and the ones that uh, uh, and the uh, and the agency? Well, I'm uh, you know I'm charged with oversight over our employees, and I'm satisfied that we're on the right track. Uh, I wish I had the same oversight and authorities with outside entities. I don't. So you still don't know the full extent of what's going on at MF MMS because you haven't been able to uh, uh, do a, a complete uh, set of interviews of these former employees or existing employees, in, in this case at Chevron. I would, I would say that it's incomplete because they didn't make themselves available, yes. Now, to your, uh, to, uh, to your knowledge, were any oil company executives aware at any point that their company's employees were engaging in these illegal, improper, or unethical actions with Interior Department employees? Well, I think that uh, the, the, um, the actual representatives ranged in rank. I, I don't know if, where the executive level is, but I, I don't think it went too high. I think these are essentially market people that, that deal with our folks at, at that level as well. I don't think they're certainly they're not corporate executives of the, of the corporations. The, the uh, Justice Department has thus far declined to prosecute any of the current interior employees involved in this scandal. Uh, decisions to not prosecute are based on many factors. Uh, one is the culpability of the persons involved, but another is uh, the ability to obtain a conviction. Do you think that had the companies been more cooperative and not shielded their employees from uh, providing uh, evidence to you, that you or the Justice Department might have uncovered something uh, worthy of prosecution? Hard to tell, Congressman. Uh, I, I but it's know. Is it's it not possible. possible? Sure, it's possible. Yeah. So, so what do you recommend then, as a course of action, if the, the the basis of your testimony today is that you don't have enough information because the oil companies aren't allowing you to in, uh, to uh, to interview the witnesses, so that you can make a recommendation as to how we make sure that there is proper accountability? What do you recommend? Well, I, we, we, we discussed that whole issue with the Department of Justice and, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and this isn't the first time I've been disappointed by decisions made over there. It probably won't be the last. When you say disappointed, what do you mean? It means that, it means that I, would have, I would have liked a more aggressive approach and I would have liked to have seen some other people prosecuted here, but that's not my decision to make. I get to, I get to decide what to investigate. They get to decide who to prosecute. So what is your recommendation with regard to how we now deal with uh, Chevron and their existing employees who you have not interviewed and this uh, former Shell employee that you have yet to interview, given the fact that, you know, you don't have to be Dick Tracy to figure out that they are the ones that might have the very information you need in order to make a definitive recommendation uh, as to what type of action should take place, what should happen? Well, I, once again, I, I wish that, um, I, well, first of all, I, there, is a, there is a discussion about how we would reach out to those companies. I'm probably not the best person to do that, but certainly the Office of Government Ethics is a possibility, maybe some folks from the Ethics Department with Interior, and, and to make sure and to put our marker down as to what our expectation is, not only of our own employees, but with their employees who are doing business with us. I think there are sus suspension debarment considerations we could give to the employees. Um, so I think there's a variety of things that can be done and I would, I would think that as the Secretary <coughs> goes about his lessons learned process that, that some of those issues will come up. I would certainly stand ready to help him with that. Well, I've sent a letter to the CEOs of those two companies because I believe that the taxpayers have a right to have these answers from big oil. I think they have a right to know what happened uh, to the money that rightly belongs to the taxpayers of our country. Uh, this is something that goes right to the heart uh, of, of, of uh, accountability in terms of tax evasion and, uh, and I don't think that we can rest uh, until we have gotten to the bottom of this. I thank you, Mr. Devaney, for your work and uh, for all of the people who work for you and uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sally, it is back to it. 
gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Sally. Uh, actually, from Idaho, Mr. Idaho. Chairman. But, <laughs> um, Get it all right here in a minute. Uh, well, f uh, first, so somewhere out west. Uh, the gentleman first, from somewhere out west is recognized. First of all, I want to thank both of you for being here today, and I want to try and add a little scope to what's going on here. Um, uh, Secretary Kempler, and you know, first of all, I, I know that a number of people have praised you for the job that you've done in handling the situation. Um, some of them have chosen immediately after that to uh, uh, treat you in a way that I would suggest is disrespectful under the circumstances. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've been here and uh, the, the temper that you've shown in trying to respond to these questions. The, the, it, Mr. Devaney, if, if, the, if I understand things correctly, your job as the Inspector General is to deal with, with the issues that relate to employees of the Department of Interior. Yes. And uh, if there was a prosecution of anybody from any of the oil companies, uh, that would be outside the scope of your office. Isn't that correct? We would probably be involved in the investigation, but the decision to do that would be at the Department of Justice. And and you could your that decision would be solely in that office and have nothing at all to do with you. Right. And if there were going to be a real investigation of any of those oil companies, that would not take place in your office as a primary effort. It would take place in the Department of, of Justice. Isn't that correct? Yes. And so the the notion that uh, somehow you ought to be held responsible for whether people were being held to the right ethical standards or whether they were being pro prosecuted, that's, that's really unfair to ask people on this committee to, to have you make that kind of judgment call. Isn't that correct? Well, it, it's true that I don't have any authority over those folks. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Kempthorne, the, the same is true for you. You, you, uh, you don't have any control over what the Department of Justice does uh, with people outside of your department, correct? That's correct. And so the, the notion, the suggestion that somehow you should be responsible uh, for the ethical conduct uh, of those who are outside of your office, that, that's out of sight of your authority, isn't it? That's correct. All right, thank you. Um, the, the, uh, I guess I want to note that I'm, I'm a little dismayed that we've had uh, so much uh, important business that's been before Congress dealing with energy, and a lot of it deals with uh, with your department, Mr. Secretary, and we've not had the opportunity to even have a hearing on those, but uh, uh, any of those matters. We had a bill that we voted on just the other night that was a, a, a fairly uh, broad scope uh, energy bill. We didn't even have a hearing on that, and yet we're dealing with a, a hearing on uh, the issues that are before us, and I want to try and get to the scale of what those issues are. Now, both of you have testified that 99.9 percent .9 of the employees within the Department of Interior uh, act in, in a way that uh, I think would be approved of by the, the taxpayers of this country. you agree with that? Both of you agree with that? Yes, we agree. And, and so this, I, I've heard the term a culture of exclusivity. Uh, I think that was your, your term, Mr. Right. Devaney. When you're talking about one-tenth of one percent, uh, and I know that's a generalization, it may not even be that much, how, how do you get a culture of anything out of a tenth of a percent? Uh, Congressman, I was talking about the culture of that program, the RIK program. I think they, they, over a period of time, developed that culture, that the rules simply didn't apply to them, that the rest of us in government have to follow. It, it, but anybody who wants to characterize a, a culture of corruption within the Department of Interior specifically, uh, that, that would be a, a gross exaggeration, wouldn't it? Both of you agree with that? Uh, yes. I would agree with that. Okay. And, and so I, I guess when we get to the, the, the point of the scale of this, it was a, a limited number of people, and I think the chairman had uh, one of the people that was in charge stand up and, and acknowledge her as a person who did have high ethical standards. I, I guess my, my point is this. Um, if, if, uh, if we were going to uh, be concerned about this uh, in terms of scale, it is a limited number of people. Both of you agree with that. Uh, and, and, and secondly, I think both of you have agreed that this is not something that you have a concern that this is a continuing way of doing business, either in the RIK program or anywhere else within the Department of Interior. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm satisfied that we're on the right track with the RIK program. It's been put on track. 
Okay, Mr. Devaney, are you telling us that there are issues that uh, uh, in other parts of the Department of Interior that you're concerned about? Uh, I, I, like any, like any group of people, 70,000 people, there are always going to be are you problems. Are you investigating any of those things currently? Of course. Uh, that relate to, to this kind of activity? No. Well, no. All right. So, so the kind of activity, as, as the Secretary has indicated, you, you've assured him there's no problem with this uh, kind, of, kind of activity on an ongoing basis. That, that's a correct statement. You support that, right? Y yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. My, I see my time has expired. Gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, it has been noted that, um, that we acted on an um, important energy bill uh, this week. And uh, while I would have uh, liked to have had the opportunity to have this go through the subcommittee or the full committee, while there has been criticism raised there, I think it's important to note that the subcommittee has held 14 hearings on energy-related matters of which uh, uh, the Department and the various agencies within the Department have testified. Uh, 14 hearings in 2007 and 2008 are joint committee hearings, and we have had an additional six hearings this year in 2008. So for the record, let us be clear, uh, we have been trying to do our due diligence on a host of issues. Uh, that involve just not mineral and management services, but uh, the issues of uh, expansion of the Outer Continental Shelf, the potential impacts of uh, seismic issues uh, relating to energy recovery, uh, so um, uranium recovery, uh, the list goes on and on and on. So I will submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman, so that we make the record straight as to our efforts to do our due diligence. We can always do better, clearly. That uh, objection will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the area that you talked about. Uh, first of all, you talked about the expansion uh, on the um, investigation. I assume you had the resources to continue that expansion. Uh, we have um, we have dedicated uh, we have now dedicated a, a discrete number of auditors and investigators in Denver to to provide constant oversight over the the royalty and kind program. Um, as I indicated in my opening remarks, I would like someday in the not too distant future to expand that oversight over the Bureau of Oil and you know, Minerals activity on uh, BLM land and on Indian lands. Uh, I don't have the resources to do that right now. Uh, do you, uh, can you tell us how much resources you would need to deal with that? Uh, it is in the vicinity of two million, probably. All right. We will pursue that. Are there other aspects of the mineral and management services that you think should be studied by your office, especially as it relates to the potential uh, if we do, as I said in my opening statement, expand the outer continental shelf, which I think we need to do for both oil and natural gas? Uh, we, we, intend to, we intend to provide uh, oversight in areas that we haven't done it before. Uh, we intend to, in the very near future, look at volume. For instance, uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So we're going to be getting into some areas that we haven't looked at before, but um, the resources that we have now and the ones I just mentioned should be sufficient. Okay, but I think in terms of for further expansion, we should have further discussion to ensure that uh, you're able to do your job. I was appalled. I suspect, like many other members of the committee, to hear you say that uh, in terms of your investigation, uh, that you. Um, on the royalties and kind payment program, that uh, the, the contracts uh, were so poor uh, the way they were written uh, that no uh, real audit could be performed. Um, I think your statement was policy contracts are so poor they were un be unable to be audited. Uh, what has been changed now as we write policy contracts for the royalty and kind program? Well, my, the observation of uh, our office is that all the policies and guidance and procedures that were missing have now been put in place, that those contracts are done in a way that uh, resembles uh, what you would imagine uh, an auction would resemble, as opposed to what we found when we looked at it. Well, Mr. Secretary, I mean, is there now a pro forma Titan policy contract that is established for every uh, royalty in kind uh, that is uh, transpired on a, on a uh, uh, legal basis between the 
Department of Interior uh, through the min Mineral and Management Services to any of these energy companies that are uh, entering to, in, into these new pro processes so that we don't have a repeat of this? Um, Congressman, we have made a number of changes in policy and procedures. One of the things I would mention as well that I, in my opening testimony is the fact that we asked seven individuals that were headed by Senators Kerry and Garn to look at this, the entire program. One of the things that they recommended was the fact that we needed additional transparency, and that's one of the things that we're addressing so that these types of uh, uh, well, I believe the committee is going to want to see what that transparency is. And, and, and I mean, it seems to me that uh, I, 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 I find it hard to imagine that there wasn't a standard, standard contract, a standard contractual procedure. I mean, this is not a program that started yesterday or, 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 right. or last week. I mean, this has been s since the late 1990s. Congressman, there are standard contracts that are approved by the solicitor. And, and when have they been approved to be initiated. I mean, if they were standard contracts, why would the auditor state that, in fact, that the policy contracts were so poorly written that there were, uh, I mean, what do you just leave things blank? <laughs> How is it poorly written so that you can, you're unable to have an audit trail? Uh, we have required further demonstration uh, to support the contracts, further information to support the contracts. Under the new procedure? That's correct. Okay, so everybody now understands what the new rules are as a result of the Kerry Karn uh, Commission that you reference. They have made a number of recommendations, of which some have already been implemented, of which we are moving forward to implement a large number of those. So, uh, yes, there has been significant improvement. Uh, there will continue to be improvement. I don't think this will be a static situation. I think that we will continually seek ways that we can improve and improve transparency and improve an audit trail as well. Well, uh, America's energy future, uh, as we've all discussed uh, in, in this debate, uh, uh, truly depends in large part to our ability to provide greater stability through the expansion of our own domestic resources in the near term, especially with regards to our oil and natural gas. These are America's taxpayers' resources. I think we all acknowledge that. Uh, and therefore, we have a, uh, a fiduciary responsibility, all of us, to ensure that those, uh, re those resources that belong to all of us are, are used most effectively uh, as we deal with $4 a gallon gas prices. So uh, I, I would like, and my, my time has expired, but I would like to have a further discussion with the Department uh, and with Mineral and Management Services along with uh, the Inspector General to ensure that the new contract contracts as we look at possibly, uh, which I believe will be an expansion of those uh, leases, <clears throat> both onshore and offshore, that everybody clearly know what the rules are. Uh, my further questioning, Mr. Chairman, and because my time's expired, I, hopefully in the second round I'll get a chance to it, is to get your sense, Mr. Secretary, from whether or not, given all of your uh, exposure and, and, and the time you spent examining this fiasco, uh, whether or not you would recommend that the royalty in kind program continue or whether we uh, 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 end it, and if we continue it, under what circumstances you would, you would uh, uh, suggest to us that we contend, uh, continue it uh, with what reforms? Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I respond to that? Sure. Uh, Congressman, no, I do believe that we should continue the royalty in kind program. As has been indicated by the testimony of the Inspector General, a number of items that did not allow him to identify a variety of, of information, procedures have been changed and are in place. The fact that you now have key personnel that were not in the organizational uh, chain of command, that has been corrected so they now are in that position. So it is procedures, uh, it is policies, it is personnel that have been put in specific places, it is an, in, um, an enhancement of the communication of what the ethics are. It's not that there was a, an absence of ethics, it was an absence of the adherence to ethics that existed that much of this investigation is about. Uh, I would also indicate that, as the uh, Kerry Garn report said, 
this is, the RIK program is the appropriate uh, program to carry this out, the responsibilities. They give us a series of uh, recommendations. A GAO report has given us recommendations. And so we continue to make improvements and refinements. But it is, I believe, great progress has been made. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Yeah, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I first want to thank the Office of Inspector General for the investigation and the report that goes along with it and giving us a detailed summary of uh, not only the allegations but of the findings, uh, which are very disturbing. And I want to express especially my disappointment and disgust with the activities that took place by the people that are mentioned in this report, the employees of MMS and the activities that they conducted. I, I have some questions to the Secretary first about uh, the severity of the charges. What's your feeling as you've reviewed the report and the, the various options that are on the table in terms of penalties at the federal level that exist to deal with the charges that came out in the report? Do you feel that the penalties that we have, the laws that we have to go after the people who did these things, are they adequate to fit the severity of the crime? Congressman, <clears throat> as has been pointed out, two individuals who have now pled guilty, they await sentencing. I, I cannot state what the outcome of that will be. The Department of Justice, those were the only two where there was going to be the criminal charges uh, brought to bear. The other employees that still are within the employment of the department, they are long-term career employees. I think uh, 1998 is... Uh, when did Gregory Smith... Pardon me? The uh, program director for the RIK program, when did he come to the department? Uh, I believe that he came, he's a 20-year employee, I believe. in the 1980s. And for the charges uh, that are against him, as you look at what penalties are available, and of course you wouldn't be the one to do the prosecutions, but uh, as the Secretary of the Department and to us as the policy makers, do you feel that the penalties that the prosecutors would have uh, if they were able to go after to the maximum extent does that maximum extent reach high enough to the severity of the charges, or should those maybe be increased? Uh, Congressman, no, I, I cannot articulate for you here in this setting if I believe that the severity, I, I think they, they have a range of options. I, I must also add that I have to be mindful that because these are career employees, there's a due process. and so. Uh, I hope you can understand and appreciate. I cannot get into specifics and go by names and talk about who. Right, and, and we would all hope that that process carries itself out as swiftly as possible. And if, in fact, uh, the various people and some have pled guilty, not been charged yet, but right. uh, for the people that are still facing charges, if they're found guilty, uh, I would hope that they would be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, what one of my concerns is, uh, is the law that we can prosecute them under severe enough for the charges that they've been faced with, if in fact they were guilty? Or, or do we maybe need to look at increasing those penalties? And Congressman, again, that may be something that both the Inspector General and the Department of Justice on the side of the prosecution, they, they I would imagine, would have uh, meaningful input for you. Yeah. With regard to the personnel actions, we are looking at the full spectrum that does include termination, which is the, the uh, final action that we could take with regard to an employee within of course. the department. And for the Inspector General, is, is that something that you looked at and something that your office is in a position to make recommendations on? Uh, on the administrative, potential administrative action? Uh, and criminal um, on both sides. Well, on, on the criminal side, Congressman, um, you know, there's a variety of laws that could be brought to bear here. And obviously um, drug laws are involved in... Sure, but, but the Department of Justice decided not to prosecute Mr. Smith. And um, 
we, we made a referral, they decided not to prosecute, and he is no longer with the department, so the secretary does not have the option to take an administrative action against him. I suspect if he was still there, he might be in that category, but he's gone. And so he's, he's actually, in the bottom line here is he's not going to face criminal prosecution and he's not going to get fired because he retired. Was there, any, as far as you know at least, was there any kind of negotiation on his departure that included a, a waiver from prosecution? No, and, and, and that kind of negotiation would have been between the Department of Justice and Mr. Smith if he had an attorney, not the Department of Interior. And what is the statute of limitations there, and is that something that they can go and revisit at some other time? I suspect if, if new information came you know, forward, we could revisit it. But as of right now, uh, the Department, Department of Justice has decided to decline prosecution. With respect to the administrative sanctions, my view is that sanctions up to including removal are sufficient. I mean, the, the, the highest sanction that the Secretary could impose would be to remove somebody from office. And, uh, and, you know, they have their due process, and we'll see. Thanks. So Mr. Secretary, is, I think it's alluded to in the report about implementing a drug testing policy. Is there currently a drug testing policy, and was there one in place uh, during the time that these allegations occurred? Congressman, there's a, there is drug testing policy in the Department for certain categories. Um, the RIK program, to the best of my knowledge at this point, does not have a drug testing policy. Uh, I, I will tell you that the, the dr drug testing policies are for those who have uh, security clearance, that are in law enforcement agencies within the department, uh, where an accident has occurred with uh, government property and therefore a drug test would be administered. Um, and so, and you you do have you put a new policy in place, or are you developing? It's one that is being evaluated. Yes, okay, it's under development yes. as we speak, and look forward to seeing that as we go forward. Uh, you know, clearly, I think corruption at any level cannot be tolerated. I would encourage continued pursuit of all of the legal avenues that are available, as well as looking to see if we can do some things to increase those if they warrant. I if would just not. add, Mr. Congressman, that. Uh, I am subject to random drug tests, and I have no objection to that. Well, thank you for that. Um, would hope to see our committee move more towards uh, not only these types of investigations, but also more hearings on how we can improve our energy policy, create a real strong national energy policy that reduces our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. And I think. Your department will continue to play an important role in that discussion, uh, as it has already. Uh, hopefully, we get more aggressive in what we do to put a strong national energy policy in place so that we can actually open up more of our natural resources in this country in an environmentally safe way that we can do those things, which would, of course, create more royalties, not only for us here, but hopefully for the states as well that would participate in this solution. Uh, with that, I would yield the balance of my time and to Mr. Pierce. Mr. Chairman, may I just uh, add to the comments made by the, the Congressman, but um, as you know, we have begun the implementation of a new five-year plan for oil and gas development, uh, which will allow the next administration to have a two-year head start on putting in place a new five-year plan on the oil and gas development. We're also moving aggressively on the alternative and renewable energies. Uh, moving aggressively on that. So I uh, appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to step back for a minute, I mean, the, um, the lands and territories where the drilling is occurring um, from which these royalties come are lands that belong to the American people, and the royalties that they yield belong to the American people. So the the reason this hearing is so important is because there's a lot of pressure coming from the American people to take advantage of the resources that we have in this country, but they need to be assured um, that their ownership rights um, in those resources are going to be protected. Um, I have a couple of questions that don't necessarily all relate to one another, but. I don't understand, I mean, this uh, 
RIK program, the World Healing Time program, is a pretty important program within the mineral management service, right? It's very important. <clears throat> and the person who headed it up is, has exited the scene, right, because of their behavior. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the... The person who headed that up is gone yes. from the scene because of their behavior. They, they have chosen to retire. Chosen to retire. Um, how could, I mean, there's a suggestion that this is, was sort of a rogue person, right? But I don't understand how people at higher levels would not have been aware of this. And I was just wondering if you could take me through the chain of command, not naming names of individuals, but just right. who was the immediate supervisor of the, of the RIK person? Uh, Mr. In Chairman. title, in title. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if you don't have an objection, I'd like to ask Randall Luthi, who's the director of MMS, sure. if he could respond to some of these questions. Yeah. All right, thank you, Just pull it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Uh, my name is Randall Luthi, director of the Minerals Management uh, Service. Congressman, in terms of the of the excuse uh, me, excuse me, you want to say, I think we need a spelling of that for the recorder. L U T is in Tom H I. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Congressman. And this is just amazingly magically so. I now have a uh, microphone in front of me. Uh, in terms of the, t of the period in question, again, between 2002 and 2006, the RIK program was uh, headed in, in our Denver office, and it was reporting directly to the Associate Director of Minerals Management in D.C. That was one of the points that the Inspector General pointed out. That we, that we have a deputy associate director in Denver, and there was questions of why it was reporting directly to D.C. as opposed through a, a, a chain of command. And uh, upon reading the inspector's uh, general's report, in fact, even before then, we have changed that. It's mm -hmm. been effective now. Well, it is effective now that that uh, regular chain of command is back in place. Um, Mr. Devaney, that's strange, right, that it would have gone would have bypassed the normal chain. I mean, wouldn't that have raised some questions? Within, within an organization that's being managed well, wouldn't that raise questions before you got there with your investigation? I mean, what's your opinion of that? Well, my opinion is it's outside of the norm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when I saw it and heard about it, I was, uh, I was curious as to what was going on. I think it's important to note that the um, um, associate director in Washington is the third party in the case where the two pled guilty and uh, Mr. Smith was running the RIK program. He decided to retire. That's who he reported to mm -hmm. uh, around the deputy that is here today and we've identified as somebody right. that, that maintained her integrity throughout the investigation. So going around the, the one person in the, in the hierarchy of the organization that has well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you were curious. I don't understand why the organization wasn't curious. If, if I'm being reported to out of the chain of command, the implication is I got to know something's not right with that. And yet there didn't seem to have been the internal uh, due diligence before you arrived on the scene. Let me change directions real quick here because I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Um, we've used the term arm's length, um, Secretary, to, de to describe what we would have liked to have seen in terms of the dealings between some of the uh, employees uh, in the department and representatives of the oil industry and, and so forth. Um, and Chairman Miller, or Congressman Miller, uh, earlier was was talking about uh, what the the oil companies should be doing in terms of adhering to ethical standards. Um, I come at it with a little slightly different perspective. I, I I'm never going to start from the premise that that they'll they'll be a shining example of ethical standard in this in this kind of exchange. So I look at it in terms of how do we protect the personnel inside the department from the impulse on the other side of the table to influence them. And from what I understand, they were 
having meals, sharing cafeteria, all this other kind of thing, which is symptomatic of them not being protected from the industry that they're trying to monitor. So what I want to know is what is, how are you protecting these these auditors, monitors, other kinds of personnel from from the influence that can be exerted by the industry that they're trying to uh, police, basically, or oversee. Oversee is a better word. Carson, one of the things that we're really putting great emphasis on, and that is <clears throat> for the employees to know exactly what are the requirements, uh, what are the rules, what are the standards and the thresholds that they can and cannot exceed. Uh, we have the ethics officers. We have truly increased the, the visibility of that. Uh, we're now going to put an attorney ethics advisor that will be out there in that particular office. One of the things that I stress with all employees, and we've held a series of all employee meetings, which I don't believe there's been a number of those held in the past, uh, but with this refrain, if in doubt, don't. If you have any question about activities, if you have any question about the propriety of something, please ask the question. That's what the ethics officers officers Right, are and I for. appreciate that. I, I would just suggest that you have to structurally put in place some things that maintain distance so that you're not completely relying upon individual uh, judgment of, the, of these uh, personnel because oftentimes they're going to be put in very uh, difficult situations. You've got to create a, a structure. And the other thing in my time's out, I would just note, is I think one way to protect them further is to simplify the formulas by which these royalties um, are calculated. Because the more complicated those formulas are, I think, the more um, potential opportunity there is for, for deception and manipulation, which even if it's not illegal, uh, may result in something that deserves uh, the American people. So we have to create space, both in terms of simplifying the process by which these royalties are calculated, and I think that's why we've got questions about the RIK program, and structurally keeping some distance between the people in your department and these industries that they're supposed to be monitoring. Thank you. Uh, and Congressman, I might just add, <clears throat> I met with all of the assistant secretaries and the bureau directors of the department this week. We discussed these investigations. These reports are on our website. And what I've encouraged our assistant secretaries and bureau directors to do is to encourage our employees, 73,000 people, go look at them. Because when you read this and you read the nature of this, um, this was an absolute absence of adherence to ethics by different individuals. With all due respect, I'm encouraged to read things every day by my staff that I don't get to, so I hope that's not the extent of the message that you're trying to send because people won't on their own time decide to do that. So you, again, the structural things are very important. And, and we, we have been addressing, that's why I believe, and I, I will not speak for the Inspector General, but there has been tremendous progress that has been made structurally with regard to an ethical structure. Uh, and, and I would term it a new culture of conscience within the department to be aware of this, to be about aware of the, the atmosphere of ethics and the adherence because there is a public trust and we need to hold that sacred. Gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's amazing to see all these cameras here. I don't think I've seen this many members or cameras before. I think we were talking about sex and drugs here or something. Mm -hmm. Mr. Well, Sec sleeping that. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, yeah. Um, I don't want to sound flippant on this issue because this is extremely, you know, when the, when the 21st dollar passed, when the first in a, in a, in a, in a, a misappropriated behavior took place, this became serious. And I recognize that both Director Luthi and you, Secretary Allred, came in after this had all started. But um, I'm going to try as best I can to stay within the allotted time. And if I'll give you short, answer, short questions, if you can give me short answers. <laughs> So, Depends on the question. Secretary Kempthorne, who, and I don't need a name, but who first brought the behavioral problem to the attention of the department and the inspector? Uh, I was first made aware of this by the, the former director of MMS. Was it another employee, a whistleblower type of thing, that brought these, these misbehaviors to the attention of the department? 
That is my understanding. What steps did the department take prior to turning this over to the inspector general? I believe, and uh, the IG can affirm this, but I believe that the inspector general had received calls or notification from an employee also. Okay, so basically the, the I'm taking, Mr. Inspector, that the investigation started at the same time the Department of Administrators were aware of the situation. Yes. Did uh, Secretary Kempthorne, it took two years actually to finish this report, did that in any way hamper the offices or the department's efforts to make some kind of remediation action? Within the, uh, with the program, yes. And uh, both the Inspector General and I were frustrated by the length of time it was taking. And as Congressman Bishop has been pointed out, was the inability to take action because of the, of the uh, these are married employees? Uh, we could not in interfere with the investigation. All right. We didn't know where it would ultimately go. So you needed to wait until the investigation was over. Correct. So I understand in the three reports, in the first two you have uh, DOJ has gone after two people who basically violated revolving door statutes. Yes. Then in the next one, there were nine employees that had all sorts of behavioral problems. Am I right that none of those were administrative policy-making decisions, uh, positions, in those nine? And then in the final report, there is one individual who is named. That was a policy administrative kind of position. That individual headed up the RIK program. Was that individual removed from that position prior to the disposition of uh, the investigation? <coughs> In hindsight now, looking from either the inspector or the departments, do you think that was probably the appropriate behavior when an inspection starts, that to remove that person temporarily until the disposition of the inspection or the investigation is over is probably an appropriate behavior, appropriate response, especially if it's an administrative position? Under the conditions, uh, Congressman, yes. Um, I, I'm finding myself a little hamstrung because we're talking about personnel matter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe I can say that a determination was made that that individual should not remain in that position until this investigation was complete. The individual chose to retire. All right, and it, it, seems, it would seem to me appropriate that, that once somebody who has some kind of administrative role or policy-making role or administrative role that until an investigation is completed, no longer staying in that particular position makes sense in some particular way. Inspector, I understand this so far has cost $5 million roughly to do the investigation. The entire uh, series of cases and audits, some seven and some four others that we, where allegations were unfounded, so we have about 11 cases that were actually opened. So over a period of time, it cost that much money. And I understand that the gifts that were illegally taken, procured in some way, run between five and ten grand? Yes, in some cases, in the last It would have been cheaper for the taxpayer just to take the gifts than actually do the investigation, wouldn't it? Well, uh, the argument... That was, that, was, that was not a legitimate okay. question. Come on. All right. <laughs> All right. You did say at one time, because I'm running out, I'm going to try and hit this before the red light comes in. Mr. Inspector, you did say at one time you thought 99.9 percent of the department was ethical. This is really uh, something that should never happen. It should be stopped as soon as you find it, but is atypical of the majority of the people that are there. Yeah. May I make the assumption that you're probably saying the same thing about the industry that was part of this, too? The, the majority of those are probably going to be ethical people. This is atypical behavior. Um. I, um, I hesitate to venture any guess. I'm, I'm assuming that most people that work in the industry are. Yes. I don't know 99.9, .9, but yes. It's, I think it's, a, it's an assumption that might be made. I am um, somewhat perturbed, and I think everyone else is, that uh, results of this investigation have come to us by way of the media. They still are. And results of expansion investigation come to us by way of the media first. Uh, is it the effort of both the, the department as well as the inspector to try and make sure that this committee, or at least Congress, is kept abreast of the results before they get the chance to read about them in some other some other mechanism method? Well, it certainly it um, it was certainly my intent, and uh, I believe it. In actuality, we delivered both to the department and to the chairs of the 
committees that had written and requested it, the reports at the very same moment. And uh, the media reports uh, came later. Um, you know, we always say in our cover letter to the, to, on those reports that there's personal privacy, you know, information in these reports and it must be guarded and uh, it's been my experience that oftentimes it gets out. But it was not leaked by my office and I don't believe by the department either. Uh, and I won't even go into where that leads us from that point on here. I, I do have more questions. I realize you have a drop dead day, time when you have to leave uh, and the red light is on. I apologize for going over it even slightly. Well, of course, the record will remain open for all members to submit quish, crash, quish, questions in writing and we would uh, certainly uh, ask the Secretary and Inspector General be open for those questions and respond. We'd be happy. And we recognize your time frames and we do have a vote on the floor of the House. I am going to recognize Mr. DeFazio. Uh, but I understand this may be the last round. Is I'm willing to come back, but I understand you two both have planes to catch. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not, I'm sorry. Not, I'm sorry, sir. Not planes. I'm not going to tell you I'm leaving town. I'll be in town, but I do have a commitment. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Inspector General Devaney, I, I just want to pursue, I was, I was puzzled early on in, in your presentation. You talked about working with the Public Integrity uh, Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, and uh, you recommended prosecution of uh, two, the two highest ranking individuals involved, is that correct? Yes. And what was their response to you? Well, I think, you know, after two years of looking at the issue, they declined to prosecute. Right. But did they give you a particular reason uh -huh. why they wouldn't prosecute? No. They didn't. Okay. Uh, did you pursue that in any way? I mean, I, I, they, they, um, they understood what my position was very okay. clearly on this matter. Yes. Did you ask the secretary to perhaps talk to uh, the attorney general about the issue? No. No. Okay. Um, so we have uh, two people that uh, you feel should have been prosecuted. Now, this goes to the Chevron and the stonewalling issue. Um, if the department of uh, justice, you, you subpoenaed uh, records from them, you got records, but then you wanted to inter interview individuals and they refused. Did the Department of Justice participate in your request for the interviews? Yes. Okay. And did they threaten uh, subpoenas from the Department of Justice? Um, I, it, it wouldn't have been a subpoena. It, uh, I mean, there are some, there are, there are a number of options when uh, that the Department of Justice that they can to compel. Do. Did they to use compel. all their options to N compel? No. Okay, they did not. So the Public Integrity Division perhaps was a little less than, uh, shall we say, vigorous in the pursuit of this matter. Would that be a fair characterization? Um, as I said earlier, Congressman, I've been at this a long time, and. Um, Sometimes that's a mystery to me. Okay. All right. Now let's go, um, Mr. Secretary. Um, do you have the authority to suspend Chevron uh, from bidding uh, because of their stonewalling in this investigation? Um, I do not have a. I do not have an answer to that. Okay. Well, would like an answer, and, and let let's put it this way. If you don't have that authority, would you like Congress to make it available? Don't you think it would be a useful tool? Because, uh, I mean, I, I, when you said here that the, the way the corporations would react uh, would be uh, not to offer beyond that the $20 because it would put the federal employees in a tough situation, I, I, I just think that's, you know, I mean, having a club might be a little more effective than, you know, gee, we'll be worried that the people we're partying with here are going to be put in a tough situation if they accept these drugs, sex, or money from us. Congressman, I mean, if, there's a, if there's a clear violation of, of law, uh, then I believe that we do have. Right, but in this case, they, they were stonewalling the investigation, and it seems to me at that point a little bit of a club might have been helpful if you, if you have one. Say, well, geez, if you guys aren't going to cooperate, we don't know how big or what the extent of this was or what, how the taxpayers might have been hurt. We're going to suspend you until you find the way in your heart to cooperate with the investigation. I mean, if they want to be good corporate citizens. It, it's part of our evaluation that we're now conducting. I, I will tell you, <clears throat> and again, I, the Inspector General could affirm this, but I was, uh, I was not aware through the investigation process 
that particular corporations were not responding. Okay. All right. Um, now, I, I want to go to a, a different issue. And, I, and like uh, Mr. Pierce, I would like to get an answer. Uh, there were two years. Uh, first, the Republicans created a deep water incentive. I didn't think the industry needed deep water incentives. I opposed the bill. But the bill passed, Republican bill passed, uh, became law during the Clinton administration. Uh, there were two years in which leases were let that didn't have price thresholds on these, on these deep water uh, leases. I, I'd like to know why that happened. But beyond that, I'd also like to know why, and this again predates you, Mr. Secretary, for five and a half years, the Bush administration was aware that we weren't collecting those tens of billions of dollars, and they failed to inform this committee or the Congress, uh, and ultimately it only came out because of a, whoa, story leaked in, to a newspaper in the New York Times. Uh, so. Uh, like Mr. Pierce, I would like to understand that whole what happened both during the Clinton years and during the five and a half years in the Bush administration, who knew, who didn't know, what sorts of discussions went on, and I don't know how we could pursue that, Mr. Chairman, but I, I certainly would, because there the taxpayers have lost tens of billions of dollars. And I would further note that I gave the Congress an opportunity to rectify that with a bill on the floor of the House in July, and the gentleman from New Mexico voted no, as did virtually every Republican, I think with an exception of eight. Uh, so uh, I would like to make the taxpayers whole on that matter, uh, and I would also like to know what went on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman, may I, may I please just make a point that yes. with regard to current, we now require that a solicitor will go page by page over those agreements so that there is not an omission. If it was an omission. If it was omission. Yes. Correct. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Governor New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since the vote of mine was questioned, I would question uh, event, and I did, and it's because uh, that there is evidence that those were not mistakes, that it was intentional, and the uh, the courts have said we're wrong even to go back and ask for them to pay for these these royalties when it was intentionally left out of the contract. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, if I can further respond, the courts have not limited our ability to assess a different fee to recapture that money in any way, and that's what my bill would have done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. We have a vote on, but I do want to thank the witnesses for your testimony today. And Mr. Devaney, the work that you and your office did at the IGs is very valuable to the committee's work here. But you can certainly appreciate, and I had a chance to review the reports and see the media coverage of all this, of why the American public holds their government in such distaste and distrust and disgust today. Uh, when you have a complete breach of public trust, as we've seen now with the MMS office, it's very easy to see where that cynicism is stemming from. But I also think it's very appropriate, Mr. Secretary, that we remind ourselves and the American people that the vast majority of people working in our federal agencies and in your department are the models of public service and doing a good and decent job. What I'm concerned about, and this is my question for both of you, really, is just how confident can we be here today that more of this isn't taking place in other field offices with different responsibilities? And the reason I say that in reviewing these report, reports, and this is getting back to what Mr. Sarbanes was alluding to, is they all seem to have been triggered by some confidential source or confidential inf informant. And we know the power of peer pressure and how difficult it is for one ethical person to stand up and make that phone call and say, hey, something is not right here and we have to do something about it. Whether it was the Lakewood investigation, confidential source, whether it was the Smith investigation, whether it was the business solutions contract that the IG looked into, it was all triggered by that confidential uh, informant stepping forward. Uh, and, I, and it's my understanding, listening to your testimony here to, today, Mr. Devaney, that the IG is not delving into other field offices through M MMS to check and see if there might be similar patterns of conduct being done there, because you have no basis for it, because nothing's triggered such an investigation. And this does get back to clear, bright line rules, and it's important for those to be in place. But there's only so much we can do to legislate or for the Department to do to put rules in place that's going to instill the proper ethical conduct that we expect of our, of our public employees. And we recognize that we had a problem here in the Congress, and that's why the new Congress last year, one of the first things we did was pass the toughest ethics reform package in the history of Congress. And it took a few bad actors, our colleagues, going off to prison. It made us realize we have to tighten up our own rules.
but there's only so much you can do in that regard. But again, can you assure us with the steps that you've taken based on the investigations that you've done that this conduct isn't more permissive uh, in other, uh, in other uh, field offices out there? Because we all know how it starts, innocently enough, with, uh, with the oil representatives coming into the office to talk about contract or policy, rapport is established, a comfort level happens, friendships are developed, and then that slippery slope occurs. And then we get IG reports like we have before us today. Can either one of you uh, respond? I think this is, um, is, is an aberration. And I think the, the nature of the work that the RIK program was doing, you know, contributed to that problem. Uh, it, 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 it requires government workers to be in daily, if not hourly, contact to what the government considers to be prohibitive sources, that being somebody that's doing business or wants to do business before the, the government. And in that circumstance, the, the rules are you can't take over $20 on each occasion, you can't take $50 cumulative in a year. Um, every government employee hears that at least yearly, signs off on a document. All these people sign documents saying that they understood that w those were the rules. This particular group, because of the nature of their work, felt like they had to party and uh, have drinks and socialize with industry to collect market intelligence. And uh, obviously our investigators didn't buy that and ultimately it led, I think it led, this attitude led to uh, a permissiveness within that program. I don't think that that kind of thinking exists in the rest of the Department of Interior. Uh, if it comes to our attention, we'll aggressively pursue it. But I, but I have no reason to believe that, that this isn't an aberration. Yeah. Congressman, Secretary. if I may add to that, um, I appreciate what the Inspector General just said. And I appreciate what you said also, sir. The fact that the very vast majority of the public servants are public servants. But I don't think anybody can sit and assure members of Congress that things won't happen. Um, I think the key is that there are consequences when they do, that we pursue them to the fullest extent. And, and that's why, again, with this particular inexcusable activity, I, I can tell you, as I have, that we're looking at the full range that, would, that does include termination. Um, but the, the vast majority of the people, it is, it's disheartening to me and it's a sad situation because it, it hurts their morale when they're working. Oh, I would so agree. Hard. Mr. Secretary, I would just encourage you and your department and everyone working for you that if you feel that there's some additional authority that we can provide in order to tighten up the rules uh, and try to guard against this type of uh, conduct that you'd come to us and, and, and ask us what you need. And I'm sure you'd get the cooperation of this committee. Yeah. Uh, right, Jump to Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Requesting unanimous consent to insert the report for uh, to the Royalty Policy Committee with, as with part of the record. That objection so ordered. Mr. Inspector General, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your time this morning. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, then again, maybe not. Coming up on C-SPAN, a hearing of the Senate Republican Caucus on offshore oil drilling.